Richard was one of the first American journalists to be stationed in the People's Republic of China, opening the Time Magazine Bureau there, Beijing, in 1980. He spent 25 years as staff correspondent for the New York Times, which he has reported for more than two dozen countries in Asia, Europe, and Africa. Mr. Bernstein's articles and commentaries have appeared in the New Republic, the International Herald Tribune, Foreign Affairs, and the New York Review of Books. He's the author of nine books, including From the Center of the Earth, The Search for the Truth About China, and Ultimate Journey, Retracing the Path of an Ancient Buddhist Monk Who Crossed Asia in, Sur in Search of Enlightenment. Richard, over to you. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everyone. I first went to China in 1972. I don't, it's a little bit embarrassing to tell you that because I don't want to you know, admit to myself that I must be getting a little old if I was traveling to China in 1972. I, I, I was a, a mere boy uh, <laughs> at the time, uh, a student uh, of Chinese history, uh, and I had an opportunity to go with a student group there one month after the Nixon visit, uh, which after uh, a long period of no relations with China opened up a new relationship. Uh, formal relations with China were established in 1979, the very year that they were broken with Iran. And uh, that was when I was able to go as a journalist for Time magazine. Uh, I, I arrived in very early 1980, and I stayed for three and a half years. When you went to China in 1972, and actually up until about 1980, maybe almost 1981, uh, you went via Hong Kong, and you took a train from Kowloon in Hong Kong, and you arrived at a place on the border called Lo Wu, and you crossed over a trestle bridge. And I remember the first time I did this, a, a, a thrilling sight was the uh, Chinese uh, red flag on one side of the bridge, and on the near side was the British, uh, the Union Jack, because of course Hong Kong was a British colony uh, then until 1997. And you walked over a trestle bridge, and then you went into a little shed, and there were a few immigration officers in this shed, and you know the number of people that were processed through this shed was probably you know, a couple hundred people a day, if, if, if that. Uh, you could hear pigs grunting in a nearby state, uh, uh, pe people's commune. Uh, they were farmers. You could kind of glimpse farmers through the trees uh, cat with those balancing poles, carrying whatever uh, uh, they were carrying. And the name of this little remote village on the other side of Hong Kong was Shenzhen. Does Shenzhen mean anything to anybody? Shenzhen is, was the first of the free uh, economic zones in China. It is now a city of about 18 million people. When I first went there in 1972, it was a small farming village. China in 1972 and, and still in 1970 and 1980 when I first experienced it, was like uh, something that had been frozen in amber. <clears throat> you had the impression that architecturally, physically, <clears throat> almost nothing had changed since the 1920s and 1930s. You could go to Shanghai and stand on the Bund, the, the wharf, along the Wampo River, <clears throat> and look up at the buildings. And you could look at a photograph of historical Shanghai from the 1930s and building for building, for building, for building, it was exactly the same. Nothing had changed. You stayed uh, at the Peace Hotel, formerly the Cathay Hotel, built by an Iraqi Jewish entrepreneur uh, named uh, Sassoon, from the famous Sassoon family in the, in the early 1930s. Uh, Noel Coward uh, wrote one of his most famous plays there. Uh, it was still there, unchanged. Uh, the rooms hadn't been updated. Uh, fortunately, they had been very luxurious and very comfortable when they were built, and they were still pretty, by Chinese standards, OK. It was really kind of amazing. You'd go to, go to Beijing. Uh, it was like this overgrown North Chinese village with amazing imperial monuments in it. Uh, by now, things have become totally unrecognizable. I lived in Beijing for almost four years. Uh, I thought that I knew 
every street, every building. I certainly knew every restaurant. I knew every commission shop where you could hunt around for uh, some, uh, some old things, some antiques, uh, and then try to smuggle them out past the watchful eyes of the architecture of the Re Cultural Relics Bureau. Um, I didn't succeed very well in, the, in my smuggling efforts. Um, now, uh, as you all know, uh, China is probably the single most dynamic society in the world. It's been growing for the last 20 years at roughly 10% a year. Uh, you go to a place like Beijing, uh, and yes, of course, I still, I think I know my way around Beijing, and I know some good places to go, but I know 3% of it. Uh, when I, I, I didn't go to China for a, uh, an interval of about uh, eight or nine years, and when I got to Beijing, I felt this tremendous sense of alienation and disorientation because I didn't recognize a thing. I didn't know how to get from one place to the other. There was all this stuff uh, that had never um, existed before, and it took me really quite a long time to get readjusted to the idea that this was the same place. But that leads me to another theme. Uh, China is very, very different. Uh, it has become a completely different country from the one that I first experienced. And yet, in some ways, it is also the very same country. Uh, and one of the themes that I talk about as I continue to occasionally to do some journalism on China is not the things in China that have changed, uh, but the things that have remained the same. The Ministry of Propaganda, uh, now housed in an amazing uh, building built by Ram Kohlhaus, uh, kind of one of the centers uh, of Beijing, the, uh, the operations of the, of the police, uh, the importance of the Communist Party, uh, the imperial status of the party leader, uh, the control over the press. A lot of these things are still recognizable from the days when I was uh, living in China. Um, and like, uh, uh, but like, one of the things that's changed is the relationships that you can have with Chinese people. Again, when I was first there in 1972, and then when I lived there for four years, you could see it was beginning to shift uh, during the time that I was a journalist there. <clears throat> it was extremely difficult to have any kind of a normal relationship with any Chinese person. Um, because the Public Security Bureau kept a very watchful eye on all contacts between Chinese and foreigners. Uh, people were terrified. You could walk up to somebody on the street to ask for directions, and uh, the person would just kind of embarrassed and turn away and, uh, and walk away because that person did not want to be seen on the street talking to a foreigner. Um, even in, uh, I remember one incident, uh, I did make some friends eventually uh, in the 80s when I was there. It was a long, slow process, and I remember once I visited one of my friends uh, at his house with his wife and his, uh, his child, and as I, we spent an hour there, uh, I, uh, and, and when I walked out, uh, there was a large group of, of men. It was probably about 11 o'clock at night, and I watched as they took him away, uh, my friend, and later he reported to me that he was kept at the police station all night and interrogated about what did he talk to me about and what, you know, and, and warning him that foreign journalists are not necessarily friends of China and that he had to be careful and that all moreover he had to report on any contacts he had with me. I knew that I was followed all the time. I knew that every phone call that I made was monitored. I knew that anybody that had a relationship with me, uh, uh, of however innocent, was, uh, uh, was that that relationship was known to the Public Security Bureau. And this is one thing that's changed very happily and very enormously. You can have very, very ordinary relations with many, many different kinds of Chinese people, and you can have very, very fascinating, unhindered, untrammeled, frank, open exchanges of views, and you, you can find out all kinds of things about what people think uh, about China, uh, what they think about the government, what they think about the party leader, or what they think about issues like Tibet. Uh, and Taiwan, and most importantly, what they think about the United States. 
which if you've been reading the newspapers, China has a very complicated, troubled, and tense, uh, uh, with which China has a very complicated, troubled, and tense relationship. But you can learn a lot uh, just talking to people now, uh, from taxi drivers to intellectuals or whatever, about how Chinese people feel and what they uh, and what they think. And people, believe me, are not afraid to tell you what they think, even if it's even if what they think would be somewhat heterodox uh, and dissenting from the official point of view. So I think that one of the stand, one of the inalienable truths uh, uh, of our time. We hold these truths to be inalienable, and one of them is that you should go to China at least once in your life. Uh, it is the single most important country in the world now for the United States, and it's a country that we as citizens really almost have an obligation to know something about. Uh, the trip that we're going to take is an amazing sampling. There is no map. OK. Um, uh, we're going to be traveling the length and breadth of the country. We're going to be seeing some of the sites that have to be on everybody's bucket list, um, the Great Wall and the Forbidden City, uh, which if you've never seen them, uh, many of you probably have. But if, you've never, if you have seen them, you'll know that everybody should see them at least once. Uh, if you've seen them once, you might not want to see them a second time, but you have to see them at least, at least <laughs> once. Um, <clears throat> I've seen them many times. <laughs> Uh, we're going to be going to Luoyang, the uh, ancient uh, <coughs> capital. Uh, I've never been there, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to be going to the Panda Research Station in Sichuan, uh, which I'm also very excited about. Uh, we're going to be going to uh, the Shaolin Temple, which, uh, where martial arts were invented, at least so they say. Uh, we'll be going to Shanghai. Uh, the most amazing, vibrant, coloss urban colossus in the world. Uh, we'll be going to Hangzhou, uh, a very, very beautiful scenic city. And all along the way, uh, we will be meeting with, uh, with Chinese people. And you will be amazed at what those kinds of conversations uh, can be like and how much you can learn by talking to people. Uh, uh, about their country and about our country and about the important relationship that we have uh, between ourselves. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, being able to revisit China and to see as much of the country as we're going to be able to do on these uh, Times journeys coming up. Thank you.